Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. Temptation is all around us. It may come in varying forms, sometimes loud, sometimes in a whisper. It affects each of us in a unique way. Regardless, we all will face it. Temptation is not from God. Rather, it is from our own sinful desires. It is when we give in to those desires and embrace sin that we are traveling down a path which leads to death. So what must we do when we are faced with temptation? In James, it says that we should consider it a joy to face temptation. I never thought about it that way. To view temptation as a joy may seem unusual. However, by resisting temptation, you will be growing in patience, endurance, and into a deeper reliance on God. So when you face temptation, joyfully trust and lean upon the Lord. Well, I want to welcome all of you here at uh, Central Campus, as well as those of you who are joining us online. I don't know about you, but I was just really moved by the worship today. God is so good. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're uh, studying the book of James together, and so once again, I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to the first chapter of this um, marvelous letter. And I want to remind you that um, James was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, the half-brother of Jesus, and uh, a church that... um, was well over 10,000 people, some believe somewhere between 10,000 to 100,000 people, um, uh, formerly um, Jews who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 8, we read that a great persecution uh, broke out uh, against the church in Jerusalem, and subsequently large numbers of uh, them left their homes. They, they walked away from their livelihood, uh, and they found refuge in other parts of Israel and beyond. And so James is writing a pastoral letter to people who were once part of his congregation. And uh, he knew that they had suffered much. He knew that they had pretty much lost everything because of their faith in Jesus Christ, which may explain why he starts out his letter talking about two ways that our faith is tested. In verses 1 to 12, which we looked at um, last week, he writes that one way our faith is tested is through trials. And uh, in the passage we're going to look at today, he indicates a second way that our faith is tested, and that is uh, through temptations. And so I'm going to invite you to stand with me right now, and would you join me in reading um, this passage together? When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Well, you weren't. So I guess it wasn't up there, right? So I thought, okay, you're not with me. And I made the big mistake. I took a look and I thought, oh, well, there it is. But where am I now? Okay. All right. So how about we start with then? All right. You got it, everybody? Here we go. Then. All right. Then, after desire has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. We thank you again, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for James and for inspiring him and anointing him to write these words. And Lord, we ask that you would now help us to, um, to really understand what James was um, uh, getting at here. And we pray that you would remove distractions, that you would... Um, Uh, Lord, just help us to open up our hearts to you and to receive whatever it is you want to say to us um, uh, during this time together. Uh, Give us the courage, Lord, also to respond in whatever way uh, you would call us to. For I pray it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You may be seated. John Orkberg says, you know, if you think about it, fish are not very bright. A rainbow trout never really reflects on where his life is headed or what career he should pursue. To a fish, life is see a fly, want to fly, eat a fly. That's about it. A fish is a collection of appetites. And so here we are fishing. And we think, hey fish, swallow this lure. You think it will feed you, but it will not feed you. It's designed to hook you. And once you're hooked, you're as good as cooked. But fish never notice. Fish have been falling for this for years. You'd think that fish would wise up. You'd think when fish see their fish friends go for a lure and then suddenly fly off into space, never to return again, that they would go, whoa, I'm not doing that. But they don't. They never learn. Now, you know, when it comes to temptation, it seems we humans never learn either. All the way down through history, a similar story keeps being told again and again. In ancient scrolls, in history books, even in modern newspapers and magazines. In Genesis chapter 4, we read about the life of Cain. Cain didn't start out his week saying, you know, I'm going to murder my brother this week. That probably wasn't even on his radar. You see, he just had a little problem, and that was he was jealous of his, pro- of his brother. He was a little bit angry at his brother. Yeah, that was true. And the problem is he just kept justifying his anger and his jealousy until one day it exploded into raging hatred for Abel. And Cain did the unthinkable. He took his brother's life. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read that King David was at the height of his popularity and fame as the king of Israel, admired by people all around the then known world. And I'm sure he didn't get up one day and said, you know, I think I'm going to ruin my life today. And yet when he was relaxing one evening, enjoying the beauty and the magnificence of God's creation from the balcony of his palace, his eye caught the form of an unusually beautiful woman. And his looking turned to lusting. His lusting to a fixation to have her. And in the end, he committed adultery with her. And as you read the story, you you shake your head and you, you wonder, how could this happen to a wise man like King David? A man after God's own heart. I mean, what were you thinking, David? And yet I don't need to tell you that These are not unique, isolated events. For every story that is told in the Bible or recorded in history books, for every story that makes headlines in our day, there are thousands of similar stories being told that are every bit as devastating and painful. And whether it happens to a famous leader that we admire or just a friend that we know, We wonder, how did this happen? And why does it keep happening again and again? The heart of the issue, implies James, is a failure to take the temptation to sin seriously. And in the passage we just read together, he addresses this issue and gives us a strategy for overcoming temptation. The first step to overcoming temptation, which James identifies here in our scripture lesson, is this. Expect to be tempted. Look at verse 13. Notice James doesn't write if you are tempted. No, he writes when you are tempted. Expect it. Don't be surprised by it. Temptation is a reality. All of us have faced it and we will continue to face temptation in our lives. 
Now, it is important that I point out that even though temptation can lead to sin, temptation itself is not sin. Temptation is the invitation to do something wrong. But, it, but sin doesn't take place until we accept that invitation. I mean, even Jesus was tempted. Hebrews 4 verse 15 is speaking about Jesus when it says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are. Have you ever thought about that? You know, when you're dealing with temptation in your life and maybe sometimes you think you're the only one that deals with that. Have you ever thought that Jesus was tempted with that? He was tempted in every way as we are, yet he did not sin. So expect to be tempted. Secondly, overcome temptation by taking responsibility for your sin. Look at verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. You know, one of the reasons that we keep caving in to temptation is because we try to excuse ourselves by blaming someone else or something else. Sometimes we blame God. We say, you know, this is the way I am. You know, I can't help it. I have no control over this in my life. You know, it's my built-in weakness. And you see, what we're really doing is we're blaming God. We're sort of implying, well, this is the way you made me. And therefore, I'm not responsible for the sinful choices I'm making. You're to blame God. But James makes it very clear here that God does not tempt us. He does not entice us to sin. His very nature is contrary to this. He is holy and he's righteous and pure. He can't violate his own nature. And therefore, he does not tempt anyone. Now you say, wait a minute, Pastor. In the Lord's Prayer, didn't Jesus teach us to ask God to not lead us into temptation? Well, yes, he did. But there's a big difference between leading someone in to be tempted as a test and actually tempting them directly to sin. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, we read that God the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And this really gets at the heart of the matter that we need to understand. You see, the Bible teaches that our God is a good and faithful God who loves us, who has our best interests at heart. His desire is to see us grow closer to Him and, and, and to see our faith in Him strengthened. It is, it is never to entice us into sinning or into falling. However, there is someone whose motivation is to entice us or to tempt us into sinning. And it is the evil one. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said this about the devil. He actually referred to him um, as a thief. And he said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to steal our hope, to kill our joy, and to destroy our very lives. That is Satan's agenda. Satan is the enemy of our souls, and he would destroy us if he could. He desperately wants to separate us from God, to convince us that God is not our father, that he is not our friend, he's our enemy. And so when we pray, Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, what we're really praying is, Father, please, lead us away from the enemy of our souls. Make us sensitive to his devious ways, the traps, the temptations that he will place in our way to discourage and to defeat us. Keep us from sliding mindlessly toward evil today. 
Give us the strength, the power to overcome temptation in our lives. Whether the temptation comes from Satan and his demons or whether it comes from our society, the world around us, or whether it comes from our sinful nature within. So again, God does not tempt anyone. Now besides blaming God, you know, some people try to justify their sin by blaming other people. We rationalize saying, you know, if my boss just included me more in decision making, if he just paid me better, you know, I wouldn't talk negatively about him and our company behind his back. We justify our gossip and our slander by blaming somebody else. You know, or if women just dressed more modestly, I wouldn't lust. Or if McDonald's didn't serve hamburgers and fries. Or if pigs weren't made of bacon. You know, it just goes on and on. We blame our parents for what they did or didn't do. We blame our spouses. We blame our jobs or our bosses. We blame our circumstances. Now let me be clear, our family background, the events of our past, our present circumstances that we're in, maybe relationships that we're in and so forth, they can impact us greatly. I mean, I, I, I run into people all the time, you know, who essentially tell me, you know, there's this tape that just keeps playing. From when I was growing up, things that were said. But the reality is, whatever's on that tape is a lie. And we need to renounce that in the name of Jesus and embrace the truth of Christ, amen? But I just point that out because our past or the situation we find ourselves in right now, some of us may be in abusive relationships. Who knows what we're in? This can impact us. It can make us more vulnerable to giving in to temptation. And I don't want to minimize that. But James makes it clear that we alone must take responsibility for the decisions that we make. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by what? Their own evil desire. Some people blame God. Others blame other people. Some like to blame the devil. Well, no question, as I said a moment ago, the devil's our enemy. He is evil. He's sinister. He's sneaky. But don't give him too much credit, folks. He is not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. He's not everywhere present. If you are in Christ then you not only have the authority, but in Jesus, you have the power to say no to sin and to the devil. If we sin, it is because we choose to give in to temptation. Satan does not make us do it. And so James says, whenever a dark desire erupts in your life, whether it's lust, whether it's anger, whether it's revenge, whether it's slanderous gossip, you can know it is not coming from God. And if it's not coming from God, it is not good. It is not good. And if you choose to nurse it, to justify it, to coddle it, to let it grow and to, to gain steam in your life. And it leads you to sin. Don't blame God. Don't blame other people or even the devil. See it for what it is. It's a decision that you made. James says, resist temptation by expecting it 
and taking responsibility when you give into it. Thirdly, overcome temptation by understanding how temptation leads to sin. Look at verse 14 again. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. James spells out the temptation process that leads to sin this way. To begin with, temptation begins with an evil desire. That's what James calls it, an evil desire. You see, we all have natural desires that are actually given to us by God. I mean, the need to eat, to drink, to, to sleep. Um, I mean, if we never ate, if we never drank water, if we, if we never slept, we would die. It's when we satisfy these desires and other desires in ways that are outside of God's will that these desires become evil desires. Warren Wiersbe says, temptation is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way outside of the will of God. Look at verse 14 again. Notice it says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. It doesn't say evil desires, plural. No, it's singular, evil desire. Brian Clark says, this is referring to the one ultimate desire which makes us most vulnerable to temptation. A desire that finds its origin all the way back in the book of Genesis. Clark says, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they lived in paradise. Their relationship with God and with each other was perfect. Their environment was perfect. So how do you tempt someone who has it all? Well, you make them think that there's more. That they're missing out on something. You make them think that God isn't as good and as benevolent as they think he is. That he's deceiving them. That they won't die if they disobey him. That they will actually be like God. They'll know the difference between good and evil. And they'll experience so much more than they are right now if they would just chart their own course and stop blindly following God. Which, of course is what they did, Genesis 3. Now here's the point. Before Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they had one ultimate desire, and that was to love and live for God. After the fall, after they turned their back on God, their desire changed. And guys, I want you to get this. Their desire changed. After the fall, their desire and the desire of everyone since then has been to be our own God. Not to surrender and submit to God and to worship God, but now to be our own God. To decide for ourselves what's right and wrong. In short, to call our own shots. And this is the core desire which James refers to in verse, verse 14 as evil desire. Some translations call it lust, evil lust. It's this core desire, this core lust to be my own God. And every other evil desire stems from this core or fundamental desire. It's this idea that says, you know, I am convinced that my life would be so much better if I were running the show. Or, yes, I know what the Bible says about sexual purity, but that's old school. 
That's the wrong side of history. I know better. Or I know the Bible says that we are to bear with each other, we're to forgive each other if we have a grievance against one another. But I'm kind of ticked right now, God, and I'm going to do this my way. I know what you say, I know what the scriptures say, but no, I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to nurse this anger. I'm going to justify this. That's where temptation begins, with an evil desire. The second phase of temptation is deception. Again, look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. James uses two terms here. The words dragged away in the original language is a hunting term carries with it the idea of baiting a trap to capture an animal of some sort. The word entice is a fishing term and means to bait a hook. Both are intended to deceive. Now those of you who fish, I hope you realize that if you want to catch fish, you have to be a really good liar. That's why I don't go fishing, because I'm a lousy liar. You say, well, how so? Well, think about it. When you put that worm on that hook, and then you put that yummy-looking worm in the water, you're saying, hey, fish, see, see that worm? That is one yummy worm. If you eat that worm, it'll taste so good, you'll have a religious experience. You really need to consume this worm. And you see, that's a lie. You're not trying to feed that fish. You're trying to hook that fish so you can feed yourself. You're lying to that fish. And you don't forget that. You ask God to forgive you for that. But you see, to be successful at fishing, you have to be a master at deception. That is how temptation works. It carries with it some bait that appeals to our natural God-given desire. And it is so appealing that we often turn a blind eye to the pain, to the hurt, to the relational carnage that will follow when we take that bait. I can't tell you how many people have talked to me down through the years how after they took the bait and then seeing their life, their future, their family, their marriage go up in smoke, they said to me, I would do anything to have the opportunity to wind back the tape Phase one, evil desire. Phase two, deception. The third phase of temptation is disobedience. Look at verse 15. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. In verse 15, James switches and gives us another powerful analogy, a birth analogy. When evil desire is conceived in my mind, it is at this point that temptation needs to be dealt with. It requires a disciplined mind, it requires a strong will, In the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it involves taking every thought captive, taking those evil thoughts captive out of obedience to Christ. But if I don't say no to temptation at that point, 
then it stays in the womb of my mind. And if I continue to entertain it, and feed it, and nurture it, and rationalize it, and justify it, it will grow until it's ready to be delivered. And if I decide to give in to that temptation, my disobedience will give birth, says James, to sin. And James goes on to say is, make no mistake, that sin gives birth to death. Literally the image of the original language here is, it's stillborn. What I thought would bring me so much happiness and joy has actually broken my heart. Now some of you couples here have lived through this, literally. You've conceived a child and you were so full of excitement as you contemplated your child's arrival only to be told by your doctor that your child was stillborn. And what was to be the most joyous moment turned into absolute devastation. And my heart goes out to you just talking about it. But you see, this is the graphic imagery that James uses to get our attention. Why in verse 16, he's pleading with us, saying, don't be deceived. There is a cost that comes with sin. See it for what it is. Sin may seem appealing for a while, but it ends in death. It never delivers what it promises. Which leads us to a fourth and final way to overcome temptation. And that is to keep your trust in the Lord. Look at verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And James is saying here that unlike our enemy Satan, God's agenda for your life and mine is to pour good gifts, good things into our lives starting with spiritual rebirth, the washing away of our sins and our regrets. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> you know, we hear this often, we just take it for granted. But it is so absolutely amazing. The washing away of our sins, adopting us into his eternal family. And then the continual flow of good gifts and blessings and, and his direction and purpose and meaning and, and, and opportunities to, to grow in our faith. Not to mention the gift of spending forever with him in heaven. You could spend the rest of the evening just going through the scriptures and pointing out things like he is with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. Sticks closer than a brother. And folks, all of these truths, you know, we can take to the bank. He doesn't deceive us or trick us the way the enemy does. He isn't one way one day and then another way a day later. No, he is consistent. He is the father of heavenly lights. He's not only the creator of life, he's the source of light itself. He is light. And what that means is that there are no shadows with God. There's not some part of his character that's lurking behind the scenes that's going to jump out one day and completely change our view of who God is. No. 
What God has revealed about himself in the scriptures is totally consistent with who he is. And that means we can totally trust him. But, but you see, here's the issue. You know, do, do, we, do we believe him? I mean, how you answer that question will make all the difference in how you're going to respond to the trials that come your way and even how you deal with the temptations in your life. So let's get real practical at this point. Talk about what it means to put your trust in the Lord. To overcome temptation by putting your trust in the Lord. First of all, putting your trust in the Lord means to trust in God's word. Look at verse 18. It says, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. The word of truth refers to Christ, the living word. It also refers to the written word the Bible. James says, whereas sin gives birth to death, to darkness, to frustration, confusion, the lack of meaning, lack of satisfaction in life, and all of that wonderful stuff, God births light. He births peace, meaning, And true satisfaction in us through the word of truth. You see, the common thread to living in victory during trials and to living in victory over temptation is the word of truth. If you're going to endure trials and persevere, you have to believe that that God tells the truth. That he is a good God. That he is faithful. That he has your best interests at heart in all things, whether you see it or feel it right now or not. In the same way, if you're going to resist the temptation to worship the things of this world, to make, um, you know, the good life, the be-all and end-all of life, if you're going to resist that, that temptation that that is out there in our culture, then you have to believe that everything that is truly good and right in this life comes from God. And that it looks significantly different than what our culture says is good and exciting. You have to believe that there is nothing this world has to offer that can even come close to the life that God offers. That is, if you really embrace the life that he offers. That there is nothing in this world that's going to make you more joyful, more fulfilled, and more deeply satisfied. Now, here's the thing. If you truly believe that, well, then you will submit and surrender your life to God. You will put your full trust in Him rather than the world. A number of years ago, I was talking with a young woman who told me about a friend of hers, a wonderful, gifted woman, apparently, uh, whom she admired greatly who came to this place in her life where she figured that God just wasn't coming through for her. He wasn't giving her what she wanted and, you know, in the timeline that she had. She wasn't getting any younger and God hadn't introduced her to Mr. Wright yet. And so she decided one day that that she just couldn't trust God anymore with this area of her life. And decided to take matters into her own hands. And so she walked away from God in the church. 
And she went looking for love in all the wrong places. She began to frequent the bar scene. She began to sleep around. And after some time, she began living with a fellow. She hoped to marry one day. But years later, their relationship was incredibly rocky. It was on the verge of falling apart. And her dreams for a committed marriage relationship were, were pretty much dead. And she was not a happy camper. And you see, friends, we need to decide. Will we put our faith in Christ? Or will we put it in our culture? Will we trust Jesus? Or are we going to be God and do it our own way? Putting your trust in God means you have a deep conviction that he is right in relation to what he says about life, what he says about eternity, what he says about sex and sexual purity, what he says about what matters most in life. And you are committed to following his ways. And furthermore, putting your trust in the Lord means dealing with temptation immediately. 1 Corinthians 6.18 calls us to flee immorality, to run the other way. The way Joseph did in the Old Testament. You might remember the story. His boss's wife just thought he was pretty good looking and decided to make the move on him. And uh, he didn't sit down and have tea with her. He didn't sit down and say, well, let's talk about this or whatever. No, he turned and he ran. So often when I talk to teenagers, when I talk to young adults, and we get talking about relationships and dating and all that kind of stuff, the question they inevitably ask is, how close can you get in a relationship before it's a sin? And you know, too often, that's the attitude that we have toward temptation and sin. You know, how close can we get to the fire without being burnt? How close can I get to the edge of a cliff without falling off. Have you ever wondered how God feels about that? Well, those of you here who are parents, how comfortable are you about the idea of your son or daughter standing this close to a cliff that drops 500 feet. My, one of my sons did that in Israel. I mean, he didn't mean to. He wasn't trying to tempt me or anything. He was just oblivious. I just saw him standing incredibly close to the edge of a cliff. And instinctually as a father, I said, back away from that man. A gust of wind, anything, and you're done. That's how your heavenly father feels about you. When you have this mindset, how close can I dabble with stuff without literally falling off? See, the Bible teaches that the people who really trust in the Lord, they, they just believe him. They believe that he has their best interest at heart. He's their friend, not their enemy. And consequently, they do the opposite of standing right on the edge of sin. They don't play with fire. Again, you know, I just I was 
just going through some of the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, which I referred to a moment ago, says, flee from sexual immorality. Run. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says, flee from idolatry. In other words, run from anything that takes God's place as the object of your highest affection. Run for any counterfeit God. Anything or anyone who's more important to you than God. 1 Timothy 6.11 challenges us to flee from the love of money. Not money. Money's cool. The love of money. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee from the evil desires of youth. In other words, don't see how close to sin you can get. Stop fantasizing. Stop doing what David did when he was fixated on Bathsheba and just had to have her, even though she wasn't his to have. Stop the rationalizing, the justifying, the coddling, the nursing your desire to have something that you can't have or the desire to get even with someone. Turn around and run. Get up and change the channel. Walk away. Get out of there. You see, what James is saying is, you can do something about this. You are not helpless. Yes, God is strong and he's all-powerful and he will strengthen you and he will help you when you call out to him. But James is saying here, when it comes to temptation, you are not a victim. You have the right, you have the authority in the name of Jesus, you have the power in Jesus' name to say no. You can stop exposing yourself to images on the internet and to activities and people who tempt you to say yes to sin. So deal with sin. I'm sorry, deal with temptation immediately. And then finally, putting your trust in the Lord means giving your life to what is near and dear to the heart of Jesus. In Romans 8, 5, the Apostle Paul says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The Apostle Paul is saying here that one way to find victory over temptation and sin is to stop focusing on our sinful desires and instead focus on Jesus and on His agenda. For example, can you remember a time when you were totally engrossed in a special project of some kind? Like maybe it was rebuilding a car or um, painting a portrait, writing a song, landscaping your yard, building a set of cabinets. Whatever it was, you were extremely passionate about it and you just, you just loved doing it. I remember when I, when I was around 19 years old, my dad was building a show home. And uh, as kind of a, uh, a final test of all that he had taught me, he allowed me to do all the woodwork uh, in that house from the framing right through to uh, building the kitchen cabinets. And I was so excited and, and, and engaged in that project. Uh, I mean, I literally would forget to eat. Uh, on a regular basis, I'd just find myself, oh man, I didn't eat lunch today. I would lose track of time. I'd forget to go home when I was supposed to go home. You know, all of a sudden it starts getting dark outside. Ooh, I think I better go home. I would go to sleep at night with that project on my mind. I'd get up in the morning with that project on my mind. Can you remember being engrossed in a project like that? Well, if you can, let me ask you. While you were in the middle of that project, to what extent was temptation 
and falling into sin a problem for you? Some of you love sports. When you're in the middle of playing a game of basketball or a game of hockey, do you find yourself struggling with sexual temptation? Folks, when I play hockey, about the only thing I struggle with is for more oxygen. <laughs> but make no mistake, you know, I'm tempted like everyone else. But you know what I've discovered? I am most vulnerable to temptation when I'm sitting around vegetating, doing activities that feed my sinful nature, that, that entice my sinful nature, or doing mindless activities like watching grass grow or worms yawn, you know. <laughs> On the other hand, I'm least vulnerable to temptation when I'm intentionally spending time with my Lord or when I'm about doing my Heavenly Father's business or when I'm just having fun with friends and family or serving alongside other people in things that really matter. Paul says this in Galatians 5.13 You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. In other words, what he's saying is you have a choice. I mean, you can devote your time to serving yourself, indulging all of your, your sinful nature, chasing after pleasure or power or position or whatever it is you're after. Or you can make an investment with your life. By loving and cultivating your friendship with Jesus, investing quality time in your family, building meaningful friendships, and together with those small group of friends, giving your life away in love and service to God and to others. You know, the tragedy of your life and mine is not that we have this tendency or this bent towards selfishness and sin. The tragedy is that instead of putting our trust wholly in Jesus and loving and living all out for Him and believing that true satisfaction comes through Him and His way, we get sidetracked by passionately pursuing and serving gods who will greatly disappoint us one day. Make no mistake, the more you stay focused on Jesus, the more you trust Him and draw near to Him and live for Him and get on to His agenda for your life, the more the things of this world will grow strangely dim. Bob George says, the human soul is like a wonderfully built grand piano, a magnificent instrument. However, the quality of the music that comes from it is totally dependent upon who's at the keyboard. If a master concert pianist is at the keys, you will be carried away by the rapture of the beautiful music. But let a gorilla have a shot at that piano. And the result will not only be chaotic music, but actual damage to the instrument. And you see, folks, that is your daily choice and that is my daily choice. Will you present yourself to Jesus Christ each and every day, the master pianist who will produce the beautiful music of his life through you? Or will you present members of your body to the old nature with the discord and the destruction that it produces. 
I ask you, who is at the keyboard of your life right now? Would you please stand for closing prayer? I just want to remind you again before we go to those two questions that we ask at this point. I want to remind you again of the heart of God. I want to take you to his heart. Because sometimes messages like this can be pretty heavy. We can feel like we're just not measuring up to God. And so I want to take you to his heart again. If you've put your faith in him, he is no longer your judge. Do you, do you realize that? He's no longer your judge. No, he's your father. You're his child. He loves and accepts you. There is nothing that you can do that will make him love you any more or any less than he does right now. Nothing. Nothing will ever change your position in him. And you are not in the doghouse because you're struggling with temptation and sin. So why does he want you to stand up to temptation and to say no to sin? Is it to make you miserable? Well, no, it's for the same reason that those of you who are parents here want to see your children avoid temptation and all the pain and the carnage that comes with sin. I mean, wouldn't you be def devastated as a parent if your child was doing destructive things to herself? Drinking alcohol to excess, shooting up drugs, if she wasn't eating, wasn't learning, wasn't growing, wasn't reaching her potential, was refusing to communicate with you, making one bad decision after another, wouldn't that just rip your heart out? Well, now you know how your heavenly Father feels about all of you. Why he wants you to trust him and to live your life his way. Again, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. That is what he wants for you. That is his heart for you. And so take that to the Lord right now. Take that to the Lord right now. Open your hands to him right now. Let's do this. And here are the two questions. Lord, what are you saying to me through this service? What are you saying to me? And then, Lord, what is, is it you want me to do about it? What's even one step you want me to take today? Just take a moment right now to reflect on that and then be sure to reflect on it in the weeks to come. Every service, there have been people who have just spontaneously made their way to the altar and I just want to invite you to do that. There's just some things you might want to talk to God about. You might want to confess to God. You might want to just commit to God. Just come silently make your way down here while we wait for the next few moments. This is your time with God. Come just as you are. I'm just going to invite you to come up, please. And 
now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.